Blessings to you. Now, keeping divine doors open because who do you become after you have favor? When you have favor, favor is a pleasurable time. When you have favor, things are glorious, it's good. It feels good. It is, it, it ex, it's experiences that's heavenly. You could experience God's love when you have favor. But who, what does the favor make you? Because see, favor is a creation anointed. Me and you both know that God gives you favor even when you're not qualified for it. According to like your attributes that's being released. Like you're, you're qualified because of the blood. But sometimes the qualities in which that favor needed is not there yet. But yet God still gives it to you out of his loving kindness. So if you think about it, God gives you favor. And even when he gives you favor, he knows that there are not, is not the fullness of what that favor needs manifested in you yet. So favor is for creation. When God gives you favor, it's because he wants something to come forth and that favor is an opportunity, is an empowerment for now what was supposed to come forth to actually come forth now. So when God gives you favor, there's something that he's looking for from you. When he gives you favor, there's something that he wants to manifest. So if you take favor, and not understanding that is an exchange. Is an exchange. Because he wants something else from you. So he gives it to you as an investment. But as a result, he wants something else to spring forth from that investment. So here's the wild thing. If favor is not handled with wisdom, this is why God gets angry. That's why the wrath of God gets activated. Let me show you something. Ananias and Sapphira had favor in the New Testament. So the favor that they have is access to Peter. When they don't listen to God with the access, then God gets angry and they die. Because the favor was supposed to create honor inside of Ananias and inside of Sophia. So when it doesn't come forth, now God judges them. So hereby you see that favor is how the Holy Spirit does something for you to inspire you to do something for him. The grace of God does not mean that God is a certain way. And he stays like that no matter what I do. No. That's a lie. If that was so true, nobody would be in hell. If that was true, Lucifer would have never got kicked out of heaven. If that was true, there would not be no demons. Everybody would be angels. If that was true, we wouldn't have a soul. If that was true, we wouldn't have a body to make decisions. If that was true, there would not be a hell. God would have never created it. So God is not stuck in one position. God is not stuck in one position like, 
Okay, I'm always going to be smiling. I'm always going to be pleased with you. That's a lie. Jesus' death satisfied God, the Father. So now that God, the Father, can give you a chance to fulfill your assignment. If you don't fulfill the assignment, then what the blood paid for, there is no longer, there is no longer uh, effectiveness of that blood on your behalf. That's why a lot of people didn't even understand like the whole idea about the blood and Jesus dying. Because when Jesus died, if you reject it, there is no longer that blood effective on your behalf. Now, the blood still is effective, but it's not effective for you. I'm going to show you something in the Bible so that you can catch what I'm saying, too. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, I'm going to shock you with this, right? It says, for if we sin willfully after that we have received knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Wow. Wow. Hebrews 10, 26 says, if we sin willfully, after that we have received knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Look at verse 27, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. If we drop down to verse 30, it says, for we know that we know him that have said that vengeance belongeth to me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. The Lord shall judge his people. And look at verse 31. For it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. What this text is telling you here is that the blood no longer works. is no longer effective if you sin willfully. That means that you have knowledge. You know that God said this is not what he wants. But then you do it. The blood don't work there. It says there is no more sacrifice for sins. That means that the sacrifice that Jesus did, it does not work for you when you sin willfully. Now, of course, you can acknowledge that you sin willfully and tell the Lord, I know I did wrong. OK, let me reposition myself. I repent and dot, dot, dot. Yes. But in the state of how people have done it. There's no eternal life in that. Like when people say, you know, I know the Lord going to forgive me. The minute that they say that there's no sacrifice for sin. So. When they say, I, 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 I know that I'm doing, but I know the Lord going to forgive me. No, he's not going to forgive you. <laughs> because when you sin willfully with the knowledge of the truth, there's no sacrifice for sin. So, saints, also, I want you to catch this now. So when God gives you favor, you notice when he gives you favor, he gives you access to teachings. So, like, he'll teach you what he loves. He'll teach you what he likes. He'll teach you what is pleasing to him, what's acceptable to him. Now you're receiving what we call knowledge of the truth. So now you can respond to the favor. Because what, what is really favor, right? You're getting access to the presence of God, whether through a person, an opportunity, provision, health, uh, wisdom. You're, you're getting mentorship. The favor is giving you access into the glory realm. So remember, the glory realm is, is better than sin, all right? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory. So once you're in the glory realm via the favor of God, the favor give you access to the glory, now you are beyond sin. That's why 1 John chapter 3, verse 9 says that whoever is born of God cannot sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Because once you receive 
what favor has given you access to, which is word, which is knowledge, which is empowerment, edification, prophetic anointing, glory of God. Now you are no longer a slave to betraying God. Who do you become after you receive favor? Because favor is pleasurable. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel heavenly. But after favor, I don't want to say is done, but after the tangibility of favor is over, what do what decisions do you make? After the tangibility of favor, after you feel favor and then that 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 side effect of that favor, it dies off. Like, you know how you could take a Tynol pill? You could feel the effectiveness of the pill. But when the pill dies off, do you get depressed? Do you start fearing for pain again? So when the tangibility of God's favor, because his favor is tangible, you know, when somebody is nice to you, you know, when God opens a door for you that you've been praying for, you know, when you get connected to a prophet of God and the prophet of God is leaning in your direction, it feels great. After everything is said and done. And you don't feel the tangibility of favor. What decisions do you make? Do you take the information that was given to you during the tangibility of favor and use it when you don't feel the tangibility of favor? Do you take what was it deposited in you and apply it? Does it become a part of your personality, your character, your mindset, your vocabulary? your reactions? Does it become a shield? What I have studied in my life is that people, after they feel the tangibility of favor, they go back to sin. When the tangibility of favor was to give you an atmosphere so that you can learn, so that when you don't feel the tangibility of favor, you can continue in what you learned. God teaches you when you're inspired. So when you're not inspired, you could use the teaching to birth your own inspiration in him. He teaches you when you feel strong. So when you feel weak, you can lean on the teaching to tap back into tangible strength. But people don't do that. They go back to sin. They go back to the devil. They go back to playing with the devil. They go back to the enemy. They go back to losing. Peter felt good when he said, you are the Christ. And Jesus said, flesh and blood then revealed this to you. He felt good. He felt prophetic. He felt apostolic. He felt like he was a glory carrier. He felt like he was wise. He felt like he was set apart from the disciples. But when he doesn't feel that, he denies Jesus. When Vashti became queen, she felt the power of queenship. She felt good. But when the king said, come to me, when she didn't feel like coming, she said, no, I'm not coming. When Adam got into the garden, he felt good. He felt like he was a God. God brought the animals to him and told him to name them. He named them. He felt powerful. But then he takes the toxic fruit from his wife. The same way with the wife. She's called to be a helpmeet. She feels powerful. But then she goes and engages with the serpent. Job's wife. She felt good when he was rich. She felt good when he was buying her nice jewelry and nice clothes and taking her shopping and, and lavishing love on her. But now they're going through a test and she looks and says, let's curse God and die. Just curse God and die. These are all people that after they felt the tangibility of favor, now they don't feel it. They're not sticking with what they were taught. Lucifer did not always feel like exalting himself and making his own throne. 
Lucifer loved the idea of worshiping, loved the idea of helping God, loved the idea of blessing God. But then there's not a feeling and here come thoughts. One thing that you have to catch is when you don't feel good, you can think evil. When you don't feel good, you could think evil. That's why when you go through testings, God is not looking to make you feel good. He wants to see if you're going to stick with the teaching that was good. Even if you feel evil, you will feel evil in this life. It don't matter how anointed you are. It don't matter how much knowledge you have, you will feel evil. You will wake up some days and feel evil. You will desire to do evil. But people are not being trained of how to handle the temptation to be evil. How do you deal with it? What do you do when you feel bitterness? Why do you think so many, so many people say, I can't forgive them? Why are they saying I can't forgive them? They can forgive them, but they feel bitterness. The demon of bitterness is giving them tangibility. And saints, I want to tell you that the only way you can overcome the tangibility of darkness is you have to learn to do what God says when you don't feel the tangibility to do what he says or don't feel the tangibility of what he said. God's words don't always make you leap and rejoice. Your rejoicing comes from the maturity of knowing that this is how I should respond to what he's saying so that I don't give place to the devil. If you look for God to move you to rejoice when he speaks, you're going to lose in your walk with God because that's not how it works. Even doing the will of God, God will take away the enjoyment of obeying him to see if you're still going to obey him. Saints, for years now, I've been doing what the father tells me to do and I don't look for a feeling. I am the feeling. Because once the knowledge of the truth becomes revel revelatory to you, now you could move in the spirit and locate the fruit of joy. You could move in the spirit and locate the fruit of, of peace. You can move in the spirit and locate the fruit of love because you're in the spirit. That's why the Bible tells you to walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh in Galatians chapter five. Because when you're in the spirit, the spirit is an empowerment to locate everything that's of spirit. And love, joy, peace, rejoicing, excitement, zeal, passion, serving the Lord with gladness, Psalm 100. All of those are in the spirit realm. They're not in the flesh. So the more that you deal with God, with a fleshly attitude, you're not actually dealing with the Lord no more. You're dealing with the God of this age because that's his system. Satan operates through do what you feel like. Do what you feel like doing. You feel like slicing somebody's tires, slice their tires. You feel like slandering somebody, slander them. You feel like leaving your house because you feel like your parents not telling you that you can have your way, leave. You feel like you shouldn't listen to authority, so keep on driving when the police put the lights on. Keep on talking when the person tells you you should be quiet in the store. 
how Satan operates. And that's why so many people are serving Satan, because what Satan takes away restrictions and say, just do what you feel. If you feel like smoking, just go smoke. If you feel like lying, just lie. If you feel like being disloyal, just be disloyal. If you feel like talking about things that God have no pleasure in, just talk about it. And that's why so many people serve Satan. But what I'm telling you is that everybody will have a time in their life. There's a set time of favor for everybody. And that set time of favor is where the spirit is going to let you have access to knowledge that God loves. And if you will take in that knowledge, you will learn how to be spirit. How to walk in the spirit, live in the spirit. And fulfill your destiny via spirit and not flesh. If you constantly live by these feelings in this sense realm, in the book of Jude chapter one, it says that there are people that are sensual, not having the spirit. So the more that you operate in these senses, you leave the spirit of God and how the spirit of God moves. The more you operate in senses, the more the spirit can't talk to you can't prevail in your behavior because the sense realm, it's God is Satan. So the more you become a sensual person, you know, I, I don't want to be here because I don't feel right. God told the children in Israel to eat the manna. They said, no, I don't want it. It don't taste like what we want. We want some meat. We want some, we want some, 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 some meat. Their sense realm did not want to taste what God gave them. And now they're rebelling against God, their sense realm. Their senses is activating God's wrath. You can't build a future with people that are sensual. You can't establish a ministry with people that's sensual. You can't go forward in business for the Lord with people that's sensual because they don't have the spirit. So when they sense, that's what dictates. Not wisdom, but feelings. And saints, wisdom is higher than feelings. That's why the Bible said David behaved wisely not to kill Saul. He felt like killing Saul. But wisdom is higher than felt. Wisdom is higher than feelings. So he never killed Saul. I just want you to think about that. God gives you favor so that you can have access. So that you can hear the things that he wants from you so that it can renew your mind and you can do it. When you feel the favor, it's all easy. It's easy when you feel favor. When you feel favor, you can leap, you can run. You, everything is easy. You're not worried about going back to sin. Because you can feel. That's why a lot of people are not unlocking the plan of God for their life. Because you feel so good. Oh, I feel good. I feel good. This is good. You feel. But after you don't feel, all of your productivity stops. All of your progress stops. Because you're still sensual. Even though you're hearing spiritual things, you're still sensual. But when you become spirit, even when you don't feel, 
you still do what was revealed by the Spirit. Peter feels sleep. Jesus wants prayer. Peter goes to sleep. Jesus keeps praying. If Peter is in spirit, even though he feels sleep, he will keep praying. But because he's not spirit, he senses, he submits to the senses over spirit. Jonah, if he's spirit, he'll go to Nineveh. No complaint, no resistance. But because he's sensual, he feels like going on a ship. He goes on the ship because he is sensual. He does not go on the ship because he's spirit. He goes on the ship because he is sensual. All throughout the Bible, people forfeited their destiny because they were sensual. They were not spirit. If they were spirit, they would have succeeded. But because they was flesh, they lost. Because they were sensual, they lost. If we look at the love of God, lastly, we know that his love is not sensual, but it is spirit. Because even when God is nice to someone on earth and they live a rebellious life, he still keeps on being good. Even when Lucifer betrayed God, God did not stop trusting people. He made Adam. When Adam betrayed him, he still let creation come out of Adam. He still created, he still loved. He still pronounced upon Noah the same blessing that he pronounced upon Adam. So we know that God's love is not sensual, it is spirit. That's the same way you have to live out this life if you're gonna be successful. You have to stop trying to take spiritual things and try to accompany it with your sensual self you have to take the spiritual things and let it make you spirit in how you respond to it and how you release it in your decisions. Or else you will corrupt what is light with your darkness. And it will never accomplish in, in the reason and why it was sent. For the rest of your life, if God tells you to love somebody, Stop getting in your senses about the person. Oh, I sense that they don't like me. Oh, I sense that it, all that sensual stuff is breaking the spirit of love. For you to love them, you have to deal with the, the, uh, the instruction of love via the spirit. You can't deal with it via the sensual realm. Same way, Jesus kept telling people, come and follow me. How do you follow Jesus? The people that heard him say, drink of my blood, eat of my flesh, they were sensual. So when he said that, their senses heard it. Oh, drink of my blood. Oh, he a vampire. Eat of my flesh. He talking this weird stuff. They tried to handle it according to senses. And the, the Bible said they no longer follow Jesus. Imagine how crazy. How could you not follow your creator and he's down on earth? The Bible said they, there was many disciples that did not follow him anymore. Because Jesus is spirit. So everything that comes out of his mouth is spirit. Even when he's talking about eating my flesh, it, the stuff sounds like it's vampirish. It sounds like it is cannibalism or whatever they call it. It sounds like it's creepy because that's what senses can only interpret. But when you're in the spirit, you start realizing, oh, he said, eat of my flesh because we are the body of Christ. And if I don't partake of his flesh, I'm going to partake of the flesh realm of the devil. And the flesh realm of the devil makes enmity with me and God makes me hate God. But the flesh realm of Jesus causes me to deny myself. And then, oh, why is he talking about drink of the blood? Oh, okay, the blood. If, 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 oh, blood deals with lifestyle. 
The life is in the blood. So if he tells me to drink of his blood, he's saying, you got to partake of my lifestyle. You got to receive my bloodline. You got to receive how I think, how I evaluate things, how I look at life, how I speak, how I walk, how I talk. And so when you're in the spirit, you see how the spirit could decipher and interpret what the senses will condemn. The senses will condemn it, but the spirit will bring clarity.